Well, hi there. I am Mike Hinkson, your host for Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. And today we get to have the opportunity to chat with Tony Lebedois, who is from Canada. He works uh, and does a lot of leading things in StatsCan, and he'll tell us about that, I'm sure. He's a very active kind of guy. He has done bobsledding. He's done water skiing and, um, and, and with one ski and a number of such kinds of things. And I'm going to really leave it to him to, to tell us a whole lot more as we go through the next hour or so. But Tony, I want to welcome you to Unstoppable Mindset, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, sharing this episode with you. Well, thank you for for doing this. Well, tell me a little bit about this whole idea of of uh, bobsledding and so on. That must have been a lot of fun. Uh, I um, I'm a guy who likes to um, push the limits and live life to the fullest. I uh, I'm always assessing risks for myself as well. I I, I like to be careful for. Um, making sure I, I stay in good shape and, and healthy. But at the same time, I like to um, explore things. So when the opportunity arises, and, and there may be some of our um, listeners today that even have suggestions for me of what I, I could try to do next, but I, I'm um, always uh, looking at possibilities to um, experiment something fun, safe, and, and um, unforgettable. Well, you did say you want to jump off a mountain, right? Yeah, yeah, I would love to um, actually use a, a delta wing and in tandem jump off a mountain when the wind uh, wants to collaborate. But uh, unfortunately, so far, uh, when I tried, the wind was not there for me uh, on those days. But um, I hate, I'm still hate it when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> but someday, maybe the universe will uh, will let you do it. Uh, my high school geometry teacher had his 86th birthday yesterday. He was telling me that in the past, someone um, that he knew had actually acquired something called a powered parachute. Are you familiar with that? No. So I don't know a lot about it, but apparently it's a parachute and it has a motor on it and actually can, um, I don't know whether it's a fan or how it works, but you can strap this on, lay out the parachute, activate it, and go flying with the parachute being what what you use to control where you go and how you go and so on. And he actually, he lives in Nebraska, and he flew with it around his farm um, a couple of times. I'd never heard of a powered parachute before, so there's something else for you to uh, to explore, although I don't know whether you can do it in tandem or how that would work. I'm not sure I want to drive this. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I should explain for you listening that Tony um, is blind. He's a low vision kind of guy. And so we we share some of that, which is which is kind of fun. Um, as I was telling him once, I did alpine sliding once, which is sliding down a mountain inside of a half of a pipe on a special sled. It's a summer sport. It's a lot of fun. And uh, so you you can... If you go too fast, jump the track and you can, in, in all the twists and turns, you can have all sorts of challenges, just like if you were skiing or sledding down a mountain in the winter. So it's a, it's a way to keep ski resorts open in the summer, I guess. Well, um, yeah. And um, one other thing I, I uh, experimented in the summer and that I, I loved was uh, water slides and um, the, anything related with the, the water and the beach. Uh, I'm there. You're you're there. That well, that makes sense. I read or saw in the news last night or this morning somebody was in the ocean, and I don't remember now what state they were in. They were kind of waist deep and got stung by a stingray, which is no fun. No, nope. certainly not. I would rather not have that happen to me either. She survived. They had to surgically remove the barb, but she did survive. So I guess it's okay. Well, anyway, um, so let's kind of go back and start at the beginning. Why don't you tell us about the early Tony? Tell me about you and growing up and some of that kind of stuff. Oh, the early Tony. Um, well, oh, sure. Uh, let's go back to the beginning and figure it all out. I was born with low vision. For, for me, it's 
the vision I'm used to. It's normal vision. Um, I see colors. I, I enjoy art. I uh, travel alone or with people. And uh, I I was um, a child where the, the parents learned very early that uh, my parents that I love uh, learned I was like three or months old that I met, I might never see anything. And um, to make a long story short, they, they, they believed that everything was possible. Uh, despite the mentality of the late 60s, they um, uh, fought for making sure I would go to normal school. I would stay closer to them. I was born in the Gaspé Coast near the Atlantic Ocean in eastern Quebec, in eastern Canada, um, between the mountains and the sea. And a school for Braille or um, other things related to, to um, function as a blind person was was in Montreal. It was like 10 hours from where I was born. Yeah. So um, they, they wanted to keep me there. I, I had a, a very um, enjoyable uh, childhood. I learned to uh, go on that. A bicycle with with my, with my dad actually running after me and showing me how to to find the balance I needed. So I I, I was very introvert. I was very um, happy still, and uh, having a few friends. But uh, each time I would enter a school, uh, I knew I would have to prove that I had my place there, um, and. Um, I guess I was lucky in elementary school because I was too young to realize this, but uh, some people um, suddenly told my parents that, uh, yeah, I could I could go to regular school. And my mom was like, what do you mean? Yeah, you can go to regular school. I expected them to go to regular school. So, so my dad and, and I did my elementary school with them and then my high school with them and then decided to go for the big city in Quebec City, which was like seven hours from home to study in college and university, and I studied statistics. And um, I mean, that's, that, 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 I was still relatively quiet uh, and still much more uh, outgoing than when I was a, a teenager or even when I arrived in Quebec City. I, I Some events had happened at the end of my high school. Um, um, a prize had been, uh, introduced in the award ceremony and the prize uh, that uh, has my name on it uh, is still given uh, to uh, the, the people finishing high school in, in where I finished uh, in the Gaspé Coast. And there's a, uh, it's for, for actually for students who I successfully uh, overcome challenges uh, either physically uh, psychologically or socially and um I, i'm proud because I, as an adult i, I um, contributed to um the the, the prize itself I, I give i double the uh, the amount of money that is given by the school uh, each time it's given it's not given each year but it's given each time a student deserve it it will be 40 years next year actually uh, now that we, we talk about this, and um, it's um, I, I send a message uh, uh, to each of the the, the winners, and, and uh, I would say that uh, over thirty some winners uh, uh, after me have uh, got the prize, and um, it, it's a source of inspiration when I, I learn about the stories of, of these uh, these teenagers as well. Mm. So you um you you contribute to the prize and you help make students successful. Which school is this given? It's um they called Ecole Antoine Bernard. It's actually in uh, in the Gaspé Coast. It's a high school uh, it's a high school public high school where I went. Uh, so what kind of students have won the prize? Uh, the, the students with uh, with uh, activity limitations or disabilities. There's, there was a student even from uh, uh, Vietnam that had arrived in Canada with the wave of boat people in the uh, in the 80s. Um, there's been uh, last year that the, there were um, no two years ago that there were 
two students. It was the first time that there were two students. Uh, uh, one was a, a, a young man who was uh, playing tennis uh, at a very high level. Uh, and the young woman was um, doing all kinds of artistic uh, things, uh, including singing and, and uh, plus obviously having uh, uh, exemplary uh, behaviors and, and good uh, marks at, at school. Well, that is that is pretty cool, though, to have that kind of a prize and, and to be able to contribute to it and, and make it better. Well, so you went to college and you went to, you said, Quebec City to go to college? Yeah, and university in Quebec City as well, yeah. And you majored in statistics? Yes, yes. I um, studied there um, between a, a, a few uh, get-togethers and parties. Uh, I got my uh, uh, degree, and um, then uh, I was uh, surprised to be recruited by Statistics Canada. Uh, our national statistics uh, organization, uh, national statistics office for the country. Like in the U.S., you have the U.S. Bureau of Census and mm -hmm. uh, a number of other organizations uh, involved in uh, producing statistics for your country. Uh, right. uh, make sure that uh, your um, citizens and decision makers are uh, well equipped uh, to, to make the right decisions. In, in Canada, it's a bit more centralized. The provinces and territories have uh, a role to play in the statistical system, so um, do the, the local authorities with us. But Statistics Canada is um, uh, part of the national, the federal government, and um, it's much more centralized than in, in the U.S. And, and we cover, um, uh, in addition to the census that we do each year, census of population and, and census of agriculture, we um, have more than 350 sample surveys that are active with different frequencies. And we mostly these days integrate lots of uh, data from different sources. And we use data science to uh, also augment the, the, the power of, of uh, data insights that we, we provide to, to Canadians. Uh, we are regulated with the, the Statistics Act uh, at StatScan. And um, we um, have a, we basically cover all the, the aspects of the Canadian economy, Canadian society, and, and, and environment. Um, we um, also protect the confidentiality of the information that we receive uh, very uh, carefully, because uh, it's it's all based on trust. If if you want to have the the right picture of uh, the, of the country, uh, of every aspect of Canadian lives, uh, you need to uh, maintain a very good level of trust with uh, the, the different uh, people and businesses and other uh, organizations that respond and, and with the other stakeholders. You, you need to maintain close ties uh, with, with um, a number of um, other government organizations and uh, private sector organizations or, or uh, groups of, of, of organizations as well, associations. So what got you interested in statistics that you decided to make that your your college study? I was interested in, in science in college. In fact, my, my college was uh, all about um, pure and applied sciences. But being born with low vision, I, I had to be realistic. If I wanted to reach my full potential in a discipline, it would not necessarily be in engineering if I, anyway, I felt that way, that it would be in engineering if I wanted to visit a plant or uh, um, even in, in biology, if I wanted to um, study by myself um, uh, with the microscope and stuff. I mean, these days things have evolved, but uh, you got to remember that in the late 80s, um, when I was a student, the accommodations were not the norm in schools um, and nor in, in the, the, the labor market. And um, suddenly I, I realized that I loved maths and, and I wanted to apply maths in a way that would be useful to um, others uh, in a way that would be applied. I'm uh, an action-oriented person and, and um, I needed something that would be tangible, that would be uh, useful, not just pure math. 
or something theoretical in physics or uh, I wanted something applied and, and connected to the real world. And I, I choose statistics for, for that reason. And then I, I um, started in StatScan and then the rest is uh, uh, is history. More years of history. <laughs> yeah. So you went to StatScan basically right out of college, you said, I believe, right? Right out, right out of university. Um, and um, I left Quebec City for Ottawa. I not, did not know much about Ottawa. I came to visit Statistics Canada. And uh, the people at StatScan were really welcoming. They, they, they were um, uh, friendly. They, they, they um, were um, open. They, they were inclusive. In fact, my, my first chief was the first one to offer me accommodations. Uh, and, and she she basically told me that uh, I was hired for my competencies. Uh, I was there to uh, uh, achieve results. And, and she wanted to give me the best chances to achieve those results. And she said, you, you can list all the things you would want to get and we'll buy them and install them for you so that you, you're you productive and you, you're fully part of, uh, of the team. So for me, that was a message that was wow wow they they really really care and again at that time i had not seen that very much i had worked very successfully in summer jobs as a programmer or even in statistics for the fishing department of and oh my god the you're making me go very deep in my memories. This is fun, actually. Um, there, there was a um, um, Ministry of uh, uh, Fishing, Hunting, and, and Leisure in, in Quebec at the time. I had worked there for a summer, and then I had been a programmer analyst for a, a paper mill where my dad used to work uh, in our village. And, and yeah, I had worked successfully, but nobody had talked to me about uh, buying me a monitor arm or about uh, offering me a little telescope or other things to um, fully participate in the, in, in the in the labor market. So that's kind of was welcoming. I felt that sense of community. I, I had a fruitful career since then. And, and uh, I uh, tried a few times. I tested the waters elsewhere a few times in my career. And um, I always um, choose to stay even when I had offers elsewhere. And in retrospect, I think I think that was a, a great choice. In fact, my my um, my father-in-law uh, at the time told me that, that that because I was a bit afraid of going alone to Ottawa at first, and uh, to um, uh, have to learn English and everything. And uh, I was thinking it was like far, far away from from where my friends were and my um, comfort zone was. He said, well, don't worry, you're, you're capable. And, and the first five, five years are the, the, the most tough when you when you move somewhere. If it was very short, five years. And in retrospect, he was right. So five years seemed long at the time, but it, it flies. We, I, I think we said, Michael, previously together that, that time flies and that we better enjoy it and have the most fun because it will fly anyway. You know, it's interesting. Today, we hear a lot more about people moving around and not staying at a job. And I know, especially here in the United States, of course, a lot of it is financially motivated and so on. But you stayed even though you had other other job offers or other opportunities. What really made you stay? Um, StatScan is a place where I could contribute. I, I could um, learn about myself. I could explore my leadership, develop my leadership. Uh, I could learn and contribute. And and for me, when there's sufficient amount of learning, sufficient amount of contribution that I can uh, give somewhere and get somewhere, I stay engaged. I stay happier to wake up in the morning. Yeah, there are some mornings that are tougher than others like for everybody else, but I, I stay engaged. Uh, the, it, Statistics Canada reminds me as a professional community, I will do, make a parallel with, with the village where I come from. There's a sense of community. There's a sense of belonging. There's a, a, a network of, of colleagues that I have 
in Statistics Canada, in, in the federal uh, government, in, in uh, the the stakeholders that we have at Stats Canada, and because uh, I, I moved around a lot in Statistics Canada, we you got to know that Statistics Canada is now more than seven thousand employees, probably more than nine thousand if you count all our uh, interviewers, uh, and, and um, I'm I'm privileged enough to be among about 20 director generals uh, of the organization. So I I, um, I was even much younger and in much lower ranks, but I felt that sense of, of belonging and that sense of um, uh, being able to develop myself and create, be creative and innovate. And, and I've been offered lots of uh, cool challenges to try to, um, achieve with teams. I, I love to work in teams. I, I discovered that from myself. I discovered my leadership, as I was mentioning, by um, even having uh, the trust of, of, of others first to get to supervise a student and then to get to supervise a recruit. And it made me discover that I love that and, and that I would earn some trust in myself and others would gain some trust in, in me to give me even more people to supervise as a unit head and then as a chief. And uh, as a chief, I had to um, do special surveys on businesses, on topics that we would not normally cover in the base program of Statistics Canada, but that other clients would want to buy from us and, and, and sponsor with their funds so that we would, in record time, in six months to a year, we would do a survey from start to finish, from negotiating our contract to delivering results and presenting results to clients and other stakeholders. So it, I had an exciting career. That that's also why I stayed. Well, you um, you you started out by being extremely welcomed, which has to mean a lot, and it sounds like that's really continued through the years. When did you first start with Stats Canada? 1989, the 4th of July, 1989 was my first day. So now we're talking about, what, 34 years? Yeah. So clearly, there had to be something that made you feel welcomed continuously, much less what you then did for yourself, which is important too, and how you you grew. So I think that's that's extremely relevant. And it's so unfortunate that all too often people seem not to really do it nearly as much today, at least in, in the U.S. It's looking for the next big thing rather than might it really be best to just stick with a home? I would say that uh, that home has to be close to your own values. If your organization is... If you're not adhering to the same values than your, the organization you work for, you might not stay for very long, and, and you should not stay for too long if you realize that it's not well aligned. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that this is a key um, for for success in, in um, that sense of belonging. Um, Sharing and adhering to common values and the communication is also very important in, in, in all directions. Uh, making sure that um, the, the, the service to Canadians is, is um, also highlighted. Uh, making sure that uh, we produce that data that is important for the, the decision making and for the discussions that will lead to the decision making. And um, so that this data is a pillar for, for possible change, that sustainable change in, in, in our economy, our society. Monitoring is one thing, but, but um, also leveraging data and insights for, for making sure that the, the right development of uh, the, the policies, programs, services to Canadians happens. And um, Take, for example, what, what we're trying to do right now. I, I have the privilege also to be the, the co-leader of our disaggregated data action plan. Um, the disaggregated data action plan is, is an initiative that, that 
uh, uh, started the, a bit before COVID, but was uh, certainly accelerated with what we noticed in, in COVID-19 uh, times. As soon as COVID hit, uh, I, I thought, and I said to others around me, wow, there will be even more disparities between people, more, more um, uh, risks of, of uh, leaving behind certain segments of, of the population. And um, I was not the only one because uh, we, we got a, a significant investment in Statistics Canada to further disaggregate our, our information. Usually a, a national statistical agency would uh, produce uh, national and, and provincial or territorial level information. Disaggregating the data suddenly means that we, we um, produce information at, at much more detailed level to, to ensure that, that we reflect the differences. For example, if, if you are in a, a case where you, you look at the, the, the rate of uh, incarceration, how uh, many people are incarcerated in Canada? What's the percentage? It seems very low um, for the overall population. But if you start splitting men and women, yeah, you, you'll find differences between men and women. That's interesting. But if, if you start also looking at the, the indigenous populations versus non-indigenous, wow, you'll find a big difference for indigenous uh, that have uh, more uh, interactions with our, our justice system. And uh, you, you'll, you'll do that also for racialized populations. You, you, if you break down that group, We'll even notice that some subgroups of the racialized populations have even more higher rate than others, higher rate than others of, of incarceration or of dealings with the justice system. That's not to pinpoint them. That's actually to try to assess what kind of systemic barriers, what kind of, of um, needs they have uh, and, and that are not met because of these, these systemic barriers. And we're trying to do that in, in surveys like our labor force survey or in the, obviously we do that already and, and we've done that in the census. So we um, have a general social um, statistics program in which we are also disaggregating and producing the data is one thing, but producing the insights and, and the, 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 the tools and the training for people to understand and, and use the data in, in their um, work wherever, whatever their responsibilities are for policies, programs, uh, or um, uh, other activities in, in, in Canada. That that's that's very important. That that's when a statistical system can be in action. Take for example the uh, all the the, the the terrible events that we're facing uh, with climate change, floods, wildfires, uh, and, and and other. Uh, hazards are, are unfortunately uh, happening more and more. And the statistical agency like, uh, like Statistics Canada and, and, and have a lot of information, I have a lot of expertise in integrating data and can produce tools, training, and uh, provide data and insights to the people that assess the risks of these uh, disasters or that have to manage a, an emergency situation or to manage the recovery of a community uh, or uh, economically or socially after a disaster occurred. So I, I'm currently working with partners to try to improve the, 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 the data ecosystem in, in this context and provide them with the tools to support their activities and the information, obviously, to, to support these activities. Uh, that's a very big challenge because of the many stakeholders involved in, in such uh, programs and in such situations. Do you find that as you're, you're analyzing data um, and you're, you're providing evidence of certain kinds of conditions like indigenous people tend to have more interactions with the justice systems or climate change. Do you, do you tend to find 
resistance that says, oh, this really can't be the case or that it, it becomes politically not feasible to do? Or do you think that people are pretty much, at least in Canada, generally open to really wanting to deal with things? What, what kind of happens to all the data? I'll say that I see lots of openness. Um, certainly, uh, in in the in all levels of governments, um, we had, for example, uh, we started. Uh, I started uh, with other colleagues uh, three years ago an initiative with the um, Canadian Federation of Municipalities, uh, where we we have uh, now established a, a center for local and municipal data, and um, we provide dashboards and tools. Uh, uh, on all kinds of aspects of what's happening uh, uh, in in a city like Toronto or even a, a mid-sized city in Canada, and, and we get much more collaboration from the cities to provide data to StatsCan as well, so that we 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 have an exchange. We give them something; they provide us the the, the raw material and their priorities as well. So I see lots of openness from. The, the 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 governments at all levels, um, I will say that we need to raise awareness of the the ways, the best ways. What are the best ways to use data? What are examples of successful use of disaggregated data, for example, to uh, change a, a program, to change a a service, uh, to better serve Canadians uh, or a policy, and. Um, in the, there are some uh, times where we preach to the choir, uh, where we speak to data specialists that are all gung ho about data and they, they 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 know we need it and that's okay. We 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 don't have to convince them, but we need them as allies to further have a snowball effect in in the different um, uh, government departments, but also in in, in society in general. I'll say that, uh, that there are some trends in, in Canada, and, and we observe also what's happening in the U.S., where there, that there's some people that um, tend to believe things that are said, as long as it's said by someone that they they trust or that they 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 think as the the, the truth. And um, we we have to try our best to make them listen. To, to make sure that they um, look at the data, that they're, they're aware of the existence of the data. And then, you know, they, they can make their own choice. Uh, Statistics Canada is not involved in any political way. We, we're mm -hmm. independent and, and uh, we, we want to stay that way. But we're there to give advice on, on the, the, the importance of having the, the right information. I, I mean, in... in in, in a democracy, uh, having a, a, a transparent and neutral and, and, and apolitical uh, uh, organization that is, is arms length from uh, the, 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 the political power is, is extremely important. It, it's a, a very important mirror of what's happening in, in the country for, for different aspects of its economy, society, or environment. And uh, I strongly believe that that we we make a difference, and I strongly believe that the work will never be finished in, in making sure that we um, showcase not only the data but the the, the power that uh, leveraging the the, the the statistically sound information has towards um, uh, the, the the greater good. In fact, we we uh, we we have. Uh, a little hashtag, disaggregated data for good. Uh, and and uh, we, we really have a, a mission and vision geared towards making sure that we, we uh, improve the public good with the, the right data uh, uh, put in, in the hands of the, the decision makers and, and in the hands yeah. of all the, the, the ones that can, can um, benefit from, from information, including all citizens. Do you think um i'm just kind of curious it sort of was a natural thing that, that pops into my head do you think that what you do and the data that you collect and that you analyze and so on is treated differently in canada than the similar functions here in the u.s or do you think that 
the department, the census department and so on um, is as well trusted? Or do you think there's some, some differences? Or can you tell? Uh, I, I would not venture commenting on, mm-hmm. on that. Michael. I, I will say that, uh, that, that for, for building trust, there's a need for lots of uh, partnership and collaboration. Yeah. In the statistical system and much beyond. Uh, for preserving trust these days in any of our um, institutions, we, we need lots of communication. We need lots of, of uh, relevance, uh, lots of uh, um, um, uh, consultations as well. For example, uh, the, the, we, we um, had a, a concept since the 80s called visible minorities in Canada that uh, includes all the, the, the people of, of color. And um, it, it, we, we uh, now uh, are temporarily calling uh, the, uh, the the different uh, the, the combination of all the, the groups. We, we call them racialized groups right now. Mm-hmm. But we're consulting them. We we, we during a year um, with uh, various means, so that we try to find the best way to to uh, call the, the, the combination of these uh, of these groups in fact in our census the questions that we have uh, for ethnicity is based on how people perceive themselves and then after that we combine some answers to to create variables that are needed in terms of uh, either uh, racialized groups or uh, ethnicity or um, even if we were looking at race or things like that, and uh, yeah, I mean, we 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 were uh, also um, consulting a lot when when we introduced uh, in in Census 2021 uh, for the first time a, a detailed question on on gender. We're, we're testing right now and consulting for a possible uh, question on sexual orientation in the 2026 mm. census, um, which. Um, Will be perceived, I'm sure, as very sensitive. So the, we we the, the the fact that trust is based on on outreach and two way communication and, and uh, partnerships with the right associations and and the right stakeholders. I, I think it is key for relevance because there's lots of people um, working on data right now. There's lots of private sector organizations that have uh, um, probably. More petabytes of data than than than, than StatScan will ever have, and, mm. but how do we stay relevant in this world? I mean, it it it, it comes from making sure that we're there for the the public good and with the the the, the public and the other stakeholders uh, working with us um, uh, very closely. So it's a it's a question of of staying. Uh, well positioned and relevant and uh, obviously yes we 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 uh, we try to partner with with all the the players that have an um, an interest in 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 the same direction than us i i hear exactly what you're saying when you're talking about trust and communication and so on. i think it's extremely important and it is a it is an issue that we we often face that people tend not to communicate and sometimes they can't or sometimes they just don't want to, but it is an issue that I think is is worldwide and probably some places more than others, but it is an issue. And without good communications, without conversation, without education and awareness, it's very difficult to develop trust. And so, you know, I know, for example, we can talk and probably should some about disabilities in general. We've tended to be a little bit less a part of a lot of the conversations that people have. Um, I've heard it from people in a number of countries that that there just hasn't been as much awareness building or acceptance about disabilities. Do you do you think that's true, or or um, how are you working to to try to address those kinds of things? Yeah, I've been uh, been champion for persons with disabilities in my organization and beyond since. Uh, for 2002, and um, I've witnessed the heterogeneity of um, activity limitations of people, uh, and the, activi- the heterogeneity also of uh, 
acceptance of themselves uh, mm -hmm. and the, the heterogeneity of, of feelings that they're accepted by others, but also the heterogeneity of the creativity of, of um, people with activity limitations. I'm deliberately not using persons with disabilities just be because I think after the pandemic, it's even more obvious that it's not just the people that traditionally identify themselves as persons with disabilities that need uh, an accessible world or um, and, um, a, a number of accommodations. Um, and um, I've, I've expanded that those views in, in another podcast, actually, that uh, we have a series at, at Statistics Canada. The first uh, episode uh, of our podcast were, was on accessibility. And uh, I explained my views on, on that one in that podcast. But uh, coming back to your, your question, uh, the, the, really, the, there's um, a lot that need to be done in terms of... Uh, accessibility and person with disabilities and uh, for for um, persons with disabilities by persons with disabilities or, or people with activity limitations as well they, they need to speak up first they need to feel confident that they can speak up and, and that they they can talk about their needs that they can um, that, that they will be heard that um, and and we have a number of ways at Statistics and an organization where, where we make sure that they're heard. Then we have now with the, the newly um, uh, arrived Accessibility Act in Canada in 2019 and in the strategy for accessibility in the public service in, in, in each department, we, we have our own plans for reform enhancing accessibility. So in the public service, that, that, that there's that. In the Canadian society and economy, a lot needs to be done, even though we're one of the most fortunate country, I would say, uh, in terms of uh, accessibility and inclusion. Uh, from what I've experienced when I travel or, or by talking with others, um, we, we have created a, a Canadian accessibility network um, with the leadership of Carleton University. We are now more than 80 uh, collaborating organizations from academic, private sector, public sector, uh, nonprofit, uh, and, and all working towards more accessibility in Canada in policies, employment, uh, research and design. Uh, all kinds of aspects, and we have communities of practices that that work together to make a, a more accessible um, Canada. And I'm fortunate enough to uh, lead the, the and, and chair the advisory council uh, of, of this organization that is is made of uh, a representative of each of these organizations. And I can tell you that we're stronger together when mm -hmm. we speak. Uh, about the, the 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 not only about the issues but about the solutions that need to be brought forward uh, in uh, for a greater participation in, in the economy and, and the society. And, and I would be curious to to have your views on on how such a network should um, approach that the daunting challenge that that we have since we're only three years old. Uh, but uh, I would like to have your views on how we, we we bring more large businesses and other players on board, but also how do we have even more traction, more uh, action-oriented results, more, more impact? I think that the most important thing is to really continue to work in an educational world. Um, maybe create some events where you invite a number of the leaders of larger corporations and organizations to um, to come together and and discuss disabilities, bring in some speakers. It is something I've done before um, at various places around the U.S. and 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 in some other countries as well um, to bring in speakers to talk and interact with. So I think it's from from my perspective. As a speaker, I don't want to talk to, I want to talk with, and so I can deliver a speech, but it's even much more engaging, fun, and relevant to have a dialogue. And so I think that if you target corporations 
that are larger. And especially if you have one or two that already do become involved with persons with disabilities more, bring those in as, as featured parts of something that you do, as well as others um, who are, are visible in the disabilities community throughout the world to help educate and have as a goal to leave that event with plans for the other organizations or at least the start of building a framework of plans for the other organizations as to how they can involve more persons with disabilities. But I think the biggest thing is education, pure and simple. <clears throat> it is really that most people think that disability means a lack of ability, which isn't true. And I know people will say, well, disability begins with dis, which is not. Well, um, that isn't always the way that dis is used. Um, so uh, I don't think that it needs to be that way. And I think that that we need to really start to understand more about words and how words matter. And people seem to have no trouble with changing meanings of words. I mean, look at diversity. Diversity tends to leave out disabilities. It shouldn't, but it does. And I think there's been just by inertia attempts to try to do some of that with inclusion. But I think more people are pushing back. I know I do to say you're not inclusive unless you include people with disabilities and you can't say, well, but we do include race. Well, that's not being inclusive if you leave out other people. Diversity has already left the station. And I think that having those kinds of discussions is part of what probably is extremely important to do to help educate. But I think that we as persons with disabilities are the best people to provide teaching moments for people assuming that they want to learn. And there are a lot of people who happen to have a disability who are, they say, tired of being a teacher. Well, I don't think that we can afford that. Um, I think that we have to engage and be part of the discussion and um, help teach. And the result of that will be that there are more companies that will realize that, oh, maybe it isn't what we thought it was. And they will move forward from there. So that would be kind of one of my my immediate reactions to it um, and kind of what I would do. But I think scheduling some events and bringing people in from inside and outside Canada might be um, something that would be very helpful to be able to to start the dialogue. But you got to start somewhere. That's very interesting. Uh, the, we already have a series that we call Can Connect uh, uh, for Canadian Accessibility Network uh, and connecting ourselves. And uh, we could consider expanding this uh, into something broader uh, and even have more focused uh, meetings uh, with, with uh, some uh, organizations. Uh, thank you for that, the advice. Uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, um, we... I see a parallel between what you just said about education uh, for um, uh, making awareness better for, for persons with disabilities, by persons with disabilities, but also education, as I was mentioning, for, for statistics and the, the, the power of data. So uh, it's interesting that it, it's kind of the same answer here, uh, raise awareness with uh, a number of means to uh, make sure we... Um, uh, captivate the, the audience with the interest of the audience. Well, I think that most people want to learn. Most people maybe function a little bit out of fear, not knowing about disabilities. Um, but most people, I think, are open to wanting to do more. If they can understand, it makes good sense. I mean, look at your story. Why did you stay so long and even get started at StatsCan? You were welcome. And that is probably a little bit unusual in terms of how much you were welcome from the outset, but you started to establish credibility and people have continued to recognize that through the years. That's a story that is really hard to beat when, when people hear how someone decided that there was really no problem with hiring somebody who was different than they are 
And if we have to make some accommodations, we'll do that. And StatsCan did that, which is a wonderful story to to tell. Um, but I think there there are other stories like that, and it is certainly something that that makes sense to explore. Um, and we, we have we have lots of other stories like that. Yeah, in, in Statistics Canada, Statistics Canada is is uh, it's not just uh, words. It, it, it's right. Action uh, for equity, diversity, inclusion. Accessibility took a while for people to understand what means accessibility, uh, but now and more and more they understand because they ask the question. They, mm -hmm. Their awareness is at least to ask questions when they're starting something, to consult, to ask people to test what they're developing or to uh, provide feedback and so on. And and that's that exchange that I'm talking about. That's two way yep. communication keeps us engaged and keeps us moving forward for making an organization or society or even our own life uh, better. And I bet there are other places inside and outside Canada where you can find similar stories so that you can create an environment and invite corporations to come and hear those stories. And, and to learn and then challenge them and offer solutions to help them do the same sort of thing. And I think plenty. that's I think that's really the issue. Yeah, there are plenty of other stories, uh, uh, but making them known uh, and uh, showing to people that uh, it's it's not just to be nice. It, it's actually. Right now, with the the labor mm -hmm. shortage, it, it's a, actually a business case to uh, try to include all the, the 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 people that can participate in the labor market. Well, look at this. Look at it this way: you go into most any building, you have lights. Why? So that people can see where they're walking. You have probably coffee rooms or snack rooms where there are coffee machines or teapots or other things like that. Why? To keep employees happy. Um, everyone gets a computer monitor who needs a computer. Why? So that they can do their business. Those are all things that the general corporate world regards as some of the costs of doing business. What isn't so viewed so often is making accommodations for persons with disabilities, like you talked about some of the things that you needed or, or I might need or ask for a screen reader or access to some other technologies that I might need in order to be able to function as well. Those two should be part of the cost of doing business. And what we really need to do is to educate people to the reality that they are part of the cost of doing business. And the people who realize that and provide those accommodations and hire people are more likely, statistically speaking, to have employees that will stay loyal because we know how hard it was to get the job in the first place. Yeah, and, and I, I will say that again, that there's a need for that conversation with all employees because of the, sure. changing, the changing workplace conditions that we have right now after COVID with hybrid work, with, um, and, and let's say, a, a number of open space that are, are desks, but they're, they're not desks assigned to a certain individual and so on. Some people were not perceiving themselves uh, as having a disability, but they had an implicit accommodation, some implicit accommodations in, in the previous models, but suddenly mm -hmm. the models changed. And, and 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 when those models are changing, it it comes back to what we measure. When we measure uh, 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 disability or other characteristics in our Canadian survey on disability, by the way, our results will will come out in um, later this year, close to the uh, International Day uh, for mm -hmm. Persons with Disabilities uh, in December. I believe we're we're going to release on December first or something like that. That when we measure, it, it, it's a social model. It, it, the model is based on, on 
the the barriers that people experience in their lives. Like for ethnicity, when I mentioned uh, 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 that we were measuring how people perceive themselves, we here measure how they perceive the, the environment around them and, and themselves for, for certain aspects of, the, of their daily life, their interactions in, in society and, and the economy of Canada. And you sort of realize after that that, that, that you, you get more people with activity limitations than the ones that would tick a box. Are you a person with disability, yes or no? Or which disability do you have in the list? When you ask them about if they feel pain, uh, how is it? Is it light? Uh, is it moderate? Is it high? Is it uh, seldom? Is it often? Is it all the time? Suddenly, you, you, you get much finer results and much more accurate results and, and much more information on how these people need to be accommodated and, and how they, they, they need uh, the world to be accessible, uh, how they can participate in the, the, the workplace and so on. So th th there's a, a number of people right now that need uh, 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 and and some some accommodations, some some accessibility, but they're not used to speak about it. Mm -hmm. they, sure. they're not. They didn't have to before, but suddenly because of the barriers that this new environment created for them, oops, they they, they didn't perceive themselves as persons with disabilities. Imagine that you're just living with someone that uh, has a, a weak immune system. You don't yeah. want to catch COVID or something else. Imagine well, that you, you have developed more anxiety uh, of germs or of uh, the social uh, gatherings uh, with huge crowds because of COVID. Or imagine that you, you were always um, um, with anxiety, but it was well con controlled. But suddenly you, you, you were going to your office, you knew who your neighbors would be, you, you were at predictability in the meeting rooms you would use and so on. But suddenly, whoops! You you're booking an if, office like if it was a parking lot. Yep. And you don't know who's going to be in the parkings besides you. Yeah. That, that's changing the whole game for some people. And, we and we have to raise awareness about that too. We tend to not like change as much as we think we do, even though we say change is always all around us. And so, <laughs> COVID certainly was a great teacher in that regard. Uh, for exactly the reasons that you said, and it is something that we need to look at and do need to address. And we we get way too comfortable sometimes. And I appreciate comfort. I like comfort as well as the next person. But I also know that there's a lot of value in going out of what your typical comfort zone is. I um, and you somewhat, although you have some eyesight, but I would say every time I cross the street, I'm going out of my comfort zone. Who knows what that car that I might hear way down the street is going to do? Are they going to stop or not? And so we we all have challenges. And I would also say that not one single person on this planet is a person without a disability. Most people's disability is light dependence, you know, just have the power go out in a building and see how well people do until they find yeah. a new yeah. light source. You and yeah. I are much better in those conditions than most of them, yeah. Well, I, the I, problem I, is that technology I, has covered it up for people because we've yeah. made light on demand such a popular and important thing in our lives. It doesn't yeah. change the fact that they're disabled or they're persons with disabilities because they're light dependent. So, you know, it is uh, it is something we have to deal with. You the, mentioned that you're the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just about to say uh, that we develop a lot of abilities in our lives. As human yep. beings, we can develop a lot of abilities. Yep. I was, I was a shy person. I, I was not mm -hmm. accepting myself really well with my, my low vision. And suddenly, the, the, uh, the, the, this prize that, that uh, has my name on it, uh, that, that I was awarded for the first winner of the prize, I mean, that made me reflect during that summer. That made me realize that I had developed strengths that others were recognizing and that I, I was neglecting. I was not necessarily seeing them as much as I should. And I, I should work on, on those strengths. So when I arrived in Quebec City, I had a different mindset. 
I had the mindset where I, I decided to experiment day after day to slowly get out of my comfort zone. I was at the point earlier in, in my life where I was shy to ask for the time to someone on the street because I had not the watch. I, I didn't have my watch or something. But I decided to go forward and make friends. I decided to go forward and, and ask for things that I needed. I decided to accept myself, embrace myself, and, and to develop my abilities. I didn't know where it would lead. I never expected that I would have the, the life I have or, and uh, all the experiences that I had along the, the way in this wonderful journey. And it's not over. I hope it's not over unless I, I fall under uh, just at the, 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 the bottom of the mountain when I jump. But I, I hope I, I'm going to develop and explore even more of these things and, and that I'm developing. So it, I think it's it's very important to, to recognize that any human being can develop themselves, can, can know themselves better and learn to trust themselves and, and get out of their shell and, get, and gain the recognition, the credibility, the trust from others, as you were saying before so that they, they, they're even more feeling that snowball effect to uh, grow and everybody can grow. And, and in fact, I realized that it's my initial condition that made me uh, the person with the values that I have and that, that, that shaped my character, that, that shaped what I could do with my life. But obviously, yeah, I needed others around me to uh, encourage me to do it. I had great parents. I had great friends along the way. I, I, I had great colleagues in Saskatchewan and and and, uh, and supervisors as well, and, and great employees. I mean, those employees would probably have elected me in senior positions much earlier if it was for them, because they were the first ones to to suggest I should apply to more senior positions as I was going in my career. They, they were the ones who, who, who pushed me and made me reflect that I could push myself. So I think human beings have abilities that they need to develop. And regardless of the, their, their initial conditions, they, they, they got to stay positive and, and believe in them, learn to believe in themselves. Which is what unstoppable mindset is really all about. And we all can be more unstoppable than we think we can if we really explore it and really think about it. And listening to you, clearly a lot of what you have done is because you made certain choices and you decided to stick with it and they worked out or if they didn't, then you reevaluated, but it is all about choice, but it is about choice of growing and becoming more than what you were before. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Uh, I think, um, Again, yeah, I, I I was asked in the first few weeks in StatScan uh, if I had a career plan where I would see myself in one year, two years, five years. I said, wow, no, I don't. So, yeah, I, I reflected I had a kind of a plan in my mind, but I was always open to all the, the, the possibilities, all the doors. Maybe it's important to be really... Um, watching for doors that, that can open for you in, in personal life or, or professional life. Like, like we're here. I mean, suddenly uh, uh, someone saw me somewhere and uh, got a little message and then we, we got connected, which, which is wonderful. But if I had neglected that door, it might, as, it might have been closed as quickly as it opened. Correct. And, be, being looking around, always aware of, of what's happening. What are the currents? Uh, what are what, where is the wind blowing? And deciding without remorse and regrets where we go uh, as captain of our own journey is is extremely important. And, and opening those doors, looking at those doors that are open, what's behind them, is also extremely important. And we may choose not to enter or to enter. It's it's uh, it's important to to do that consciously, and some people don't realize or or don't 
take risks, uh, and, mm -hmm. and risk is important to mitigate. We talked about that at the, uh, in the first few comments in, in this uh, conversation. But it's important to, uh, once we've evaluated the risk, to, to take it and, and, and move forward. But you can't take the risk until you evaluate it, and you're absolutely right. You, you have to look at it. And in reality, life is all about choices. Yes. You can choose what to do or what not to do. And okay, it may not be the right choice as it turns out. Fine. It might very well be that that happens. If it does, then you go back and you look at what you do instead. Other doors will open. And what we do have to look for them, as you said. Not, not choosing is not the right choice because suddenly you're just... Correct. Well, it is a choice. It's not a good choice. You're, you're like a leaf in the wind, and, and, and it's kind of scary. So uh, I prefer choosing, even if sometimes I'm wrong. Yeah. And live with the consequences and then learn from the mistakes. Learning from the mistakes as, as we need to observe what doors are opening and, and, and what's behind those doors. We also need to reflect uh, uh, on, on what we can learn from from those bad choices or, or or even a lack of choice or lack of awareness of something. Sure. And uh, then move forward as well with that learning in our, in our uh, luggage. Got to start by choosing. Well, I want to thank you for being here. And I think that the advice that, and the things that we've just talked about are, are extremely invaluable for anyone. And I hope that people will take them to heart. If people want to reach out to you or learn more, how do they do that? Well, I'm very active on LinkedIn, um, and um, I'm easy I'm to gonna, find as well. I'm going to let my, you spell your name. <laughs> yeah, my, my name is T-O-N-Y, Tony. Labillois, the last name is L-A-B-I-L-L-O-I-S. If you type Tony Labillois on, on Google or anywhere, you'll likely find me and, and my, my email address uh, or, or something to find me. And... Um, uh, please reach out uh, if you want to. Um, it, it, it could be for statistics. It could be for accessibility, disability. It could be for anything we've discussed today uh, or more. If you see opportunities for us to collaborate, Michael, or, or uh, uh, some of your listeners see uh, other opportunities to collaborate with me or my organizations uh, that I'm involved in, I would be very happy uh, to explore possibilities again in, in the same spirit that we talked about those doors and uh, those opportunities and uh, the, those uh, ways to move forward. Thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate you listening to us out there. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me, I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. Feel free to email me at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at Accessibility accessibe.com, or go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. Love to hear your thoughts. Tony, if you or any of you listening might know of anyone else who ought to be a guest on Unstoppable Mindset, I'd love to hear from you. We're always looking for people who want to come on and tell their stories and talk about things like we did today. So please uh, feel free. And wherever you're listening, please give us a five-star rating. We appreciate your ratings. We love those five-star ratings and hope that you'll continue to listen and support us with them and keep coming back and, and spending more time with us. So, Tony, one more time, I want to really thank you for being with us, and we ought to do this again in the future. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure, Michael. Thank you.